So I, I had a set of questions I would be willing to ask the panel, but I want to open this up to you online, um, out in the field, as Russell was saying, or in the room. Uh, and again, some of us, we, you know, we may not have given you all the time you wanted to also ask individual questions, but please, at this point, if you have questions for the panel, we'll start in the room here. We have one right here. Oh, just when it, we have to get you the microphone. I'm sorry for the recording. Okay. Sorry. I'd like to ask about uh, the possibility or if you have any experience with setting up digital service centers for other areas of colleges within the university and how you handle that. Um, acquiring digital data from other departments and is that based on some type of uh, cost recovery formula or how you handle that and manage that? I haven't personally been involved with it, but I know of an organization that's recently gone through it um, as a service as a service provider, um, working with Archivematica. So Copal, which is on the west coast of Canada, um, is an organization of colleges, um, and they're small, very small colleges, and there's one larger one. I think I'm not sure if it's Simon Fraser. I think is the host um, for this, but they've just contracted with Archivematica to, which is a digital preservation system where you put your files in, um, you can add metadata, and then it and then it creates your archival information packages for you. It's not a storage service. It doesn't. It's not a repository in that way, um, but it's this preservation layer of services that need to happen on your content. So they've just set up. They've just launched about a month ago um, as a service provider for their colleges that sort of have, have come into this uh, group. And they have three levels of service that they're providing. They're providing either just the initial, um, uh, you put your files in, they get virus checked, we know what they are, you get a fixity, and then they sort of go into storage, and then that organization can deal with them however they want. Or they can sort of go fully through to create a preservation and an access copy. And then their other level of service is that they also provide hosting for the access platform, uh, which is a platform called Atom, Access to Memory. Um, so not only do you have your preservation uh, activities cr uh, completed and, and your preservation copies stored, but also your, your access copies go into a front public serving um, uh, thing. So they've just set that up as a model. And I know they're very happy to talk about how they did that um, and sort of their membership model, how they went about that. And then um, uh, Courtney Muma, who works with Artifactual Systems, um, was consulted to them in looking at how could they use, how could they do it as a, the software as a service running from COPAL and not from their own organization. Um, so I know that they've just recently gone through that, and it's been very successful um, as far as I've heard. It's, I think it took them, they were been planning it for a couple of years and trying to get all the players on board and figure out how would this work, what, what, are, what in fact are the services anyone wants, um, and then what, what different levels that might um, their various uh, participants uh, want to be dealing with. But that's a great one um, that I know of recently that's just happened. So where I work, um, so Harvard is, is very big and distributed. So, so the center part of it where I work is, is actually a service provider for um, all of Harvard libraries, archives, and museums. And um, for the repository, what we do is th there's a central fund <coughs> that each, each school pays into based on, um, uh, it's, it's a variety of things, but um, number of students, et cetera. And, so that pays for the, the kind of the, the core infrastructure of the repository, the central catalog, et cetera. Um, and then there's a, a usage fee on top of that that pays for incremental storage. It's, it's pretty small, but anyway, it's, so that takes, um, so, so you might have a, a small department that's putting a lot of content into the repository. So that incremental storage fee takes care of that case. And Sorry, another, another place that's more of a, um, I think you were also mentioning the idea of a data provider, so it's kind of, uh, like a coordinated thing. The Digital Commonwealth um, in Massachusetts, I think that's what it's called, right? Yeah. Um, is another place where uh, for, for organizations that don't have the capacity for either sort of digitizing their own content or hosting their own content, um, they, can, they can partner with Digital Commonwealth to um, make their own local content uh, digitized and available through a common portal. 
that then is out to the citizenry of Massachusetts, effectively, is the idea. Um, and so that's another m model that's a little bit different than sort of the idea of preservation services, but it's a model that's out there to sort of get content in in a way that is, brings it together, which might speak a little bit more to, to what you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. But is your question about cost models? And Right, there's, there's been a lot of work um, over the past few years on cost models. Mm -hmm. You know, how, do you pay, do you have the people who put in the content pay everything right away? Do you, do you build them over time? Um, so, so there are things you can look at. Um, CDL, California Digital Library, they put together a, um, a cost model. And then there's been a project <coughs> recently in the UK. Um, four, okay, 4C, so C, 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 C. <laughs> um, that's been... They put together a report that has um, um, gives an overview of, of the different cost models out there and the things that you should consider when putting together one. Okay, uh, question from the field: uh, Are there projected sites for the 2015-16 uh, NDSR residencies? Uh, I'm not eligible, but I can strongly encourage Reed Nag them to apply. <laughs> well, for 2015, I, I know what two of the organizations will be. <laughs> will be Harvard and MIT, just because um, we're putting so much into this that that we're, you know, we we will be hosts um, for both cohorts. But the other three s slots are are still open and. If, if this person had particular places in mind that they think that we should be looking to, I, I'd love to hear that. And the Library of Congress will also um, be instituting a 2015 cohort. Um, and they can also contact us because we, we're going out to uh, recruit. That hasn't even started yet. So it will actually be three, Andre, I guess. New York. New York, Boston, and Washington, D.C. And, and there may be more. I've, I've talked to a few places that are thinking about starting up um, similar residencies. Just a brief backtrack on, uh, you were mentioning cost models. Uh, there was just a, someone had asked to repeat about the cost models. Yeah, so, um, so coming out of the um, uh, um, aligning national Aligning national in oh god in aligning approaches aligning to, approaches thank you aligning appro uh, aligning national approaches to, to digital Anadip? preservation yes. we'll just go with that <laughs> and a dip um, so there was a meeting three years ago four years ago um, that was and this is also a document that you can download freely um, as a PDF if you want um, it was edited by Nancy uh, McGovern as uh, and what they did was there was different tracks um, and what they were looking at was what are the what are the um, possibilities for alignment across nationalities in various sectors so sort of financial with organizational with technical with um, different types of ideas and then Cliff Lynch sort of did a whole pull it together and bring out some good lessons learned so out of that, one of the things that they were looking at was this idea of a cost model. Um, what, you know, how can we align so not every country is trying to develop all their own cost models out there? So that was one thing that came out of that. They decided that there, there, there should be a reference model like the OIS reference model for cost. Um, so based on that, and then that got taken forward further with um, funding from JISC, and that's now the, the, the 4C, not C4. I made that as a bad... Um, Google search the other day, and that was not a good one to have. Um, for C, and it's the cost for calculating curation. Um, we'll just say over time, there's a fourth C in there somewhere, but that's what it is. It's, it's calculating the costs of curation. So that's uh, a model that, like Andrew was saying, they've put out a lot on that. They've done um, a lot of looking at uh, what are the other models, what are people talking about, how to make value propositions, how do you sort of explain these types of things. And then from that, there's a further um, particular cost reference model that they're building out. Um, and if you um, look up 4C, the 4C program right now, um, there's a really extensive website with all the resources that they have on there, the various models, this idea of value statements and value propositions, how do you get people on board to understand funding and these funding models. Um, but those are three of the sort of main main ones. And the Blue Ribbon Task Force for Sustainable um, Digital 
for economic sustainability of digital um, uh, material, which was uh, also uh, a US funded thing. Sorry, that's where the cost models came out of, the, the BRTF. Um, and that was a thing where they looked at um, privately held, um, like film, publicly held uh, sort of media, um, and a couple other areas. They didn't look at libraries and archives because they decided we already had it, we, we knew what we were up to financially, I guess. Um, but out of that report, there's a lot of also really good case studies. There was a whole um, uh, uh, in-person panels and, and talks about it. So online, you can watch and listen to the people that sort of came together at the end to summarize up what, what did they come up with. But again, really good information on value propositions um, and, and sort of making the case for how much will it cost and therefore how much do we need to sort of figure out um, how to pay for. I think uh, what Kari mentioned, if you're searching for that, it's under Educopia. Educopia Publications. And they also did an Anadap 2. And I'm, uh, I don't know if you've been through it or anyone's been through it yet. I can't tell you exactly what's in that, but uh, they're both good publications. When you start looking at um, digital preservation, particularly for smaller libraries, there's always a challenge of, uh, well, a technical challenge come as far as storage and whether or not you're putting it in the cloud or you're trying to maintain the uh, necessary technology um, in-house and most importantly, the skills to manage that technology. Uh, have you seen a lot of challenges? Um, I know we have it with the smaller libraries, but I uh, want to get your take on it as far as the larger libraries go. And are you partnering with the uh, campus MIS to help you manage uh, your storage needs? I can start the conversation. I think this is a, this is a big question. Um, I, can, I can tell you what, what we do. Um, so we do, um, we've had a lot of reorganization, um, but um, so, so the, the the group that takes care of our technology of our storage system is part of the central IT now, but that group, their only customer is the library. So, <laughs> so, so they, um, but so they they understand the preservation need. They understand the library applications. Mm -hmm. So it's it's actually it's easy for us to communicate with them um, rather than if it was purely s central IT. Because if you are working with central IT, you'll have you'll have a challenge because. They they won't understand the preservation needs exactly, and and they are they are different. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, our central IT, you know, not not the the library central IT, they they want to, to come up with um, commodity infrastructure that they just replicate and they use for everybody. You know, they would be happy if they dealt with the same company for everything. Um, but for us, you know, we say no. We um, Diversity in infrastructure is important to us. We can't put all of our content on one single type of infrastructure. We need to have different types of media and, and that kind of thing. So it, it's been kind of an educational process. Um, and something I can recommend, if you, if you ever need to make the case to your central IT for, for why, how, why preservation is different, is, um, is um, try, try to send, send at least one of your system administrators to, um, there's a one-day workshop at the Library of Congress in the fall. Um, and it's called storage. I I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, it's kind of, um, it's a working group. That, are you talking about the one through NDSA? No, it's J Jane Mandelbaum. Oh, Jane's. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So so it's a. Huh. It, maybe if you look up Library of Congress storage, um, or send me an email. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, send send one of us an email because. It's, it's one day, and it's very technical. They bring in vendors who, who understand preservation, and so it's a good sharing of information. And, and your, your system administrator who participates, they get, they get to hear why it's different. Um. Uh, the one thing I wanted to echo is Andrea, before Kari speaks, is we're currently in a de uh, we're very decentralized. Uh, IT and the digital uh, initiatives part of the Library of Congress, which is the Office of Strategic Initiatives. Um, it was at one time over information technology services. And I think the move now is tending to take the IT component, which provides services for all of the Library of Congress and part of the 
U.S. Congress and the Senate and move it out from underneath the Digital Preservation uh, Department. Um, we don't know where. Um, there's a nine-month, uh, possibly a nine-month, it should be over in January. Um, another agency is looking at exactly where should IT services be, but Andrea is right on target. It is very difficult until it was moved uh, under the Office of Strategic Initiatives, which was also the CIO, um, that it was it was a big disparity between the digital preservation efforts and what IT was, uh, what their focus was. They just were not on the same ship. The, um, just ad addressing the question of whether um, maybe things can be in the cloud and service providers and, and these other things as well. Um, uh, in some ways, that, that technology question really comes from the organization. So it's the what is your content? Um, there's certain places where you can't put things. If you put things in the cloud, it has to be the cloud, but in a geographic area. Um, so um, DuraCloud mm -hmm. um, is a great organization to um, Duraspace. Sorry, <laughs> no, it's Duraspace. It's a great organization to contact about. You know, so I have these requirements for my kinds of content, my kinds of stuff, um, the policies that surround it legally or um, otherwise organizationally. So for corporate, this is a, you know a great opportunity as well. Um, and then and then they can help you to find the cloud providers that can that can do those things for you. So they can say this one does this and this, this one does this and this, and then you can therefore, so they sort of help to vet things initially for you. Um, so that's a great organization to go to. But, but Andrea was exactly right on the idea of you want things in the, you know, things in the cloud is great, but you also need tape backup. You also want spinning disk. You also want, you know, and geographically dispersed things as well, which is why when you're talking to your local IT, um, it's the it's great if they can do that for you, but exactly to, to, to the point of the it can't be homogeneous. Um, so if they're willing to do that, that's good. Also, the skills to have in-house. Sometimes this is an area where bringing someone in to kind of have some of those discussions, help you set up what are your requirements for the storage areas, for uh, preservation storage, um, can be a really useful activity um, to even just help you think out, right, so we're going to need checksums and checksum checking. We're going to need um, the ability to recreate things over time. We're going to need the ability to... Um, store things in multiple locations. Or maybe we have a partner organization that we're going to work with to help with some of that replica, uh, replicated storage. So if you can help some, if you can bring someone in to help you come up with what are the technical requirements that then you can show to your IT, this is what we, what we did at MIT, um, then they can say, oh, right, we can do that ourselves, or we need to go out to the larger MIS um, within, our, within our larger organization. So that can also help help you to be able to give them the information that they need to, to make the decisions to help inform you back on what, where, where you might need to go with things. You know, they've, they've also just done um, uh, an unbiased report, Congressional Research Service. It actually just came out two days ago uh, on the security issues surrounding cloud storage. Mm -hmm. So if you remind me when you drop a note, and I'll make sure you have a card before I leave, I can also share that with you because if security is an issue, this is an excellent report to read. Right, and in the, tra in the tradition of bringing up reports that we can't remember the name of, I'll bring up another one. <laughs> 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 so there was one recently that's it's called something like Evaluating Cloud Storage Solutions for Preservation. Do you, do you all remember this? Okay, so. So anyway, it's, it's, it goes through, I think it's ten, 10 different areas that you should consider if, if you are looking, for, looking at a cloud storage solution for preservation. And then there was another group, AV Preserve, uh -huh. Audiovisual Preservation Solutions in New York, that used that, that, um, those, that criteria and they evaluated three different cloud storage um, solutions. Um, I think one of them is called eVault, which is a new solution. I think it's from EMC. Um, and I can't remember the other two they evaluated, it, possibly Preservica. Preservica. Um, but um, something that um, to think about is whether or not you already have um, IT or whether if you were to put something into place, you would need to hire. Um, because when we did, we did a, a recent um, evaluation of costs of, of what if we put one of our copies in DuraCloud, which is DuraSpace's um, cloud solution, which is basically they, they took Amazon and Rackspace and put some preservation services in front of it. 
And um, their costs have come down. I haven't looked at it again recently, but we, we looked at it. And for us, because we already have IT that we're paying, um, it wouldn't save us any money. But if you don't already have IT, one, one of these solutions you know, could end up being a good solution for you. Um, the report is cloud storage vendor profiles by AV Preserve, so like audiovisual preserve. And the ones they looked at were Chronopolis, Evolt, Glacier, mm -hmm. and Deternity. DT Ernity, Deternity, um, which was formerly Primevolt. So they looked at the, um, they did these profiles and then, and, and, then, and then put that back out there. So that's, you know, again, as you look through these, even if it's not the particular system you're looking at, it gives you the idea of what are the criteria and how to think about those things. It's also a, a strategy that we've seen in other places where, you know, for the first three years, I need to do something. So I need to put stuff somewhere um, to sort of look at a service provider to do that for you while you do look at building capacity in-house or sort of better understanding your own uh, ability to deal with the storage and the and the preservation services which is really the issue um, more than the storage um, it's the it's the the, the, serve, the preservation actions that need to be taken on the content over time um, to be able to make sure you are doing actual preservation and not just storage of the material so we've seen places where they they'll, they'll use a service provider for a few years and then decide either that's the way we got to go with it or that there's a ability to build capacity in-house as well one last question um, when you start looking at digital Preservation also, one of the challenges that you, we all will face is moving from one format to another. And we're facing that now. We're moving some items from VHS to CD, and then we're moving those items from CD to actual digital. And then even in the digital life cycle, at some point in time, we're going to change file formats. Mm -hmm. Have you started planning for that, or have you had to go through any um, situations like that? It's actually two of the NDS, the residencies that are coming up out of Boston from what, uh, what Harvard's doing, what Andrew's going to lead, and what Nancy's leading at MIT. We're doing music, so we're moving things through generation of, of music, so audio, cassette, LP, whatever it was on, into the digital, um, and then planning for future migrations. And you guys are looking at format migrations as well. What are the pathways for doing that, how to think right. about that strategically? So those are some things that will be coming up, but there are definitely places that have been going through format migration. Culpepper, uh, yeah, the Packard campus of the Library of Congress that, is, that does everything with the, the audiovisual sound, uh, everything, and um, Howard Besser of NYU is also very um, involved in, the, in their programs as well as some of his own work as far as just that particular type of, uh, of recorded materials. Um, so the, the way I, the way I kind of think about it is um, the the problem you addressed is kind of two different problems, and one is you you talked about VHS and CDs, mm -hmm. so that's the media problem, and then the other one was the digital the format to format, um, and, and at least in my organization that's two completely different groups because they are different challenges and you need to have different knowledge, um, so that that media part, um, I I think a really good um, place to look at would be Indiana University. Um, so they yeah. put, they put together this this very ambitious program, um, and I, I think we're going to be doing something very similar to um, get get content off of that that portable and, and fragile and in many cases obsolete media, and that's something that's that's a very critical problem in a lot of institutions because there's a limited lifespan for, for that, and you know some people throw out numbers of ten and twenty years that you know if you don't get it off this media you're going to lose it. Whereas the digital to digital is probably an ongoing um, challenge that we'll have over time. And the, um, the AV Preserve, um, they just put out a tool called the Cost of Inaction mm -hmm. tool. Tool? Calculator. <laughs> uh, calculator, and it specifically addresses this idea of getting uh, uh, content off media and if you don't do it. So it's looking at what are the costs for doing it sooner than later, and it helps you to sort of, the idea is to sort of make, help you make the case to people to say, we need the funding to get this, the content off the media because of if we don't do it, this is what's going to happen to it. So that's a, a nice tool to take a look at as well, a calculator. Um, we kind of, we started talking digital preservation now, but so I'm going to take it back to internships or, re or hosting in terms of job trades for just a second, because you guys have been identifying problems or concerns that you have. And I'm wondering if you have any suggestions to help, to help that poten potential hosting site or that potential job share exchange site define truly what they're trying to accomplish. 
because George had mentioned that you know now they have to do a more thorough investigation or an interview, I guess was the word, not investigation, of a potential host site. Do you have any recommendations for anyone in the room or someone's considering? Yeah, like how would they focus their need or how would they focus why they would be a great host for an intern or a share? Does that make sense? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I think you have to identify your, your potential challenges and then from that form a proposal that's a workable proposal and that can be delivered within the period of the residency, whether it be nine months or a year. Um, and, and I think Andrea mentioned it, um, and I know I certainly believe in that wholeheartedly, and that is they've got to have, the resident has to have um, something that can be delivered that is their own work, that's of resume quality, that they've, they've accomplished this. So I think it's incumbent upon the host institution to, like I say, first identify their challenges, some of their top priorities, what what do they want to accomplish, and do you have people already on board that could work with this resident to also train them and mentor them, and then you go and, and develop your proposal um, with something that's realistic. And again, not something where they're just doing research or uh, digitizing materials, but actually a, a, a taking a big chunk uh, of a particular problem and, and bringing you some solution. Um, I think that's critical. And I'm sure most institutions, large or small, are facing challenges that they need help with. But the key is, I, as I see it, is have, do you already have people on your staff that can help that individual uh, be directed um, and, and grow and deliver? Yeah. I, I agree with everything George said. I just would add that um, if you're trying to to get to, you're trying to define what, what would be a strategic thing for you to do, um, and then maybe possibly turn into a project for somebody else's, I would, I would start with some assessments. Um, so um, there are some, there's a range of different assessments, assessment tools you can use now to assess something as small as um, what level of preservation am I giving to a particular collection, to um, what level of preservation does my entire preservation repository um, what, what kind of capacity does, does it have to what does my entire digital preservation program have? Um, and I'll just name a, a few of those um, that are easy to start with. Is, um, one is called Levels of, Levels of Digital Preservation right. from the NDSA, National Digital Stewardship Alliance. So if you just search on NDSA Levels of Digital Preservation, you'll come across uh, um, an assessment, something that you can use as an assessment tool. And it's a very simple little table form, five different rows, four different levels. And the idea is um, that you should, especially if you are just starting out in digital preservation, that you should at least try to, try to, to, to obtain that level one in all these different areas, and then kind of work your way across to level four. And if you go through some of these exercises, especially if you do multiple, um, you'll start to see patterns, and you'll start to see wh where it is you need to work. Um, another one that I did recently that's, that's very new is called SCORE model. And this is coming out of a, um, a group, two different groups in Belgium and, and the Netherlands. And um, they put together this very nice online tool that you can, you can work through. And at the end, it produces a report for you. And it, and it basically shows you actually this graph. And they've done a nice job of translating all of it into English, except for <coughs> the, the very end. <laughs> um, at the very end, the picture you get, it's actually all in Dutch. But you can figure out what it is, and and you can see see where exactly are the big areas you need to work on, and and so I think that can those kind of tools can help you figure out where you should be putting your resources in strategic areas. Are there any questions in Russell in the? Okay. Did we answer your question? Sure. Excellent, because I lost my place, so good. Um, so I just joined SAA, um, and as a new SAA member, what are good resources to go to for um, local? You would mentioned some groups that were in New England, but for local help with um, digital preservation or mentors or things like that. 
um, within SAA, when you signed up, you would have had an option to sign up for like roundtables and um, and things. There's also a list of all the local area chapters. Um, so I would say check those out and kind of figure out which, depending on where you are, what's more local uh, for you. And then also find out like regionally um, what's going on. So there is, um, I know uh, in, it's not in the archives area, but the Georgia Library, Georgia Library Association. Uh, uh, also has meetings and conferences, and for instance, a couple years ago, they had Nancy and I come down and do a half-day workshop talking about digital preservation. So, um, so there's uh, opportunities, uh, sort of in this sphere, because we're talking about curation of digital objects. It sometimes those are archival, sometimes those are not. Um, and so, especially in our area right now, we've got great opportunities um, among sort of the libraries, the the archives, um, and the museums because we're all trying to deal with curation, stewardship of digital material. And at some point, it's all basically, you still need policies. You need to figure out funding. Um, and then it gets down to your own specific uh, needs and organizations. Uh, special libraries also, um, ACRL, out of the American, American Library Association. There's a lot of good things that are out there um, that are locally. But I would say, um, if you get a chance to go up to DC this year for Society of American Archives, even if you can't go to the entire meeting, the Tuesday before, the annual meeting at SAA, I'll say always, but maybe another five years, depends on how long we get it together. There's a research forum, and it's one day. If you're not, a, if you um, if you don't go to the rest of the conference, it's fifty dollars just to go to that one day, and it is a whole day of people presenting innovative research and practice into doing archives or doing innovative practice either in museums or, or libraries or archives. And a lot of it has to do with digital, but not all of it is. So another good really opportunity to go and talk with people, find out what's going on, what are they doing, um, where even if you don't stay for the whole conference, um, it's, a, it's a really, really worthwhile full day to go to if you can manage it. Um, poster sessions as well. Um, we. I'm on the program committee, and we try and take almost anybody who puts forward a, post, a poster presentation um, uh, to let people have the opportunity of, of um, having dialogue during the day, um, as well as presenting out, here's my ideas, here's what I'm working on, here's what I'm trying to, to, trying to do. And it is sort of this idea of, it's, it's try, how do I do a new thing? I'm trying something new at my place. I'm trying something new in the world. I'm trying to do these new things. So it's a great, a great place to go to sort of get, get an idea of what's happening. It's 10-minute presentation, so it's real quick. Um, but therefore, you get to hear like 50 people in one day um, find out what's going on. So it's kind of a neat, that's a neat organ, that's a neat one to go to as well. And the Society of Georgia Archivists has a list. I mean, there's not a lot of discussion on this topic that I've seen lately, but certainly putting that question out there. I mean, I don't know if you only, jo speechy, speaking, joined Society of Georgia Archivists. Okay. Just so putting that out there, and I mean that's that's another way. It's the way to do it, yeah. Um, and ARMA too. There's a lot of local ARMA chapters, um, and they generally have great like monthly meetups and things that are free and available. Right. And and the records management folks are always really great. Uh, that's another one that I know of that's usually pretty active in a in a metropolitan area anyway. So, and also, if you have any funding, there's also this Dixie Curve. The UNC oh, yeah, the Professional right. Institute that's, right. that's in North Carolina is that's offered right. once a year, and um, you get, have two opportunities. The, um, the fee allows you to go for a week and learn the whole digital object life cycle, and then you go back in January to present or you know tell them about what. So it's a little bit. Did seeker professional institute, and it's at UNC at Chapel yeah. Hill. D i g c c u r did. It's, it's digital curriculum, it's digital curation curriculum is what it stands for, um, but UNC Chapel Hill and Helen Thibault and Cal Lee are running it, and then Nancy's a, a regular presenter on that, along with um, uh, Hel uh, Carolyn Hank, um, who's now at Tennessee. Um, and, but it's, it's both the tools, it is the hands-on tools, like you're, you're actually learning how to use software and things, and then they also, and then it's um, sort of the policy development, um, thinking about how to assess your own program, um, things like that. And it's, it's very reasonable cost, I think, I mean, for what it is. Um, so it's a week, yeah, it's a week in June, and then it's another week in January, first week in January, you come back and kind of have a, co you know, and again, it's building your cohort, so it, it brings bring people back together. And then on the third day in January, there's another thing, kind of like the research fellow, which is called Curate Gear. And that's a whole day of people, again, coming into Chapel Hill and doing a full day on of um, presentations and demos of basically it's tools for digital curation. So things like you'll see Bit Curator, you'll see um, the, uh, the um, 
the uh, 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 curators workbench. You'll see sort of these different tools that people are developing and using and implementing. And then you can talk with the developers as well, which is kind of fun, because you can say, I need it to do this thing. <laughs> and they'll say, oh. Well, no one ever asked that before. Sure, let me go ahead and code that in. So it's also a really nice opportunity to do that um, if you get with a did seeker as well. Mm -hmm. um, NDSA may also, I don't know if Andrea, what she thinks, uh, might be a, just a good place that's free that you bec can become a member to start as well because mm -hmm. they have different working groups. Uh, I know there's a lot of archivists that belong to that. I know Jim Corden, uh, who was president, I think, at one time of... Yeah. Um, was a member, um, and I know Helen Tippo is on it, Nancy's and Nancy. It. Yeah. So it's it's a good place, and it's free, and it's a good place for you to have dialogue, and you can send in questions. And mm -hmm. I don't think you can have enough contact base, you know, yeah. to draw on. So that you can find that online. That's NDSA. Yeah. Uh, this is going back to the. Uh, the internship programs and various things about that, there was a specific question about housing for residents. Is that something that's accounted for in that stipend or anything? It is for us. We, uh, we had originally thought when we first did the pilot that we would uh, combine with the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities because they actually go out and have uh, pre-established housing. Um, and it's for students to uh, two bedroom and they're in safe areas within D.C. Uh, D.C., and I can't speak about Boston, D.C. is extremely expensive in the metro area. Um, and so most of the residents um, had to pay out of the stipend. We never did, we ne were never able to get that uh, hooked up uh, with Haku. So they go out, we, we give them ideas, uh, we've given them some uh, information of where they can go, this time we're going to explore it, uh, dig a little bit deeper with Haku because we've done so many favors for them, it's time they kick back to us. Uh, because as I said, you, you know, some of them have friends that they, they live with. They're very resourceful individuals, uh, they, this last group was. And, um, and some were lucky enough to have family members or distant family members they were able to stay with. Because they're making just th around 30,000 uh, for nine months. That's not a whole lot of money. Um, so the housing, yeah, is an issue, and I don't, Andrea. Yeah, we, we provide an hourly stipend, but not, um, we provide an hourly stipend, but um, they have to find the housing, but we, um, we have a project manager who, um, part of her, what she does is she, she's going to help them find um, housing, but um, we actually, the, of the five, and we didn't plan for this, but of the five we accepted, three of them will already be living there and won't need to find housing, but two of them will. Is there another question? Oh. Question from the field. Uh, you knew the topic had to come up at some point today, but uh, asking specifically about metadata and training and projects for. Um, for interns perhaps revolving around metadata. I guess met metadata is kind of a part of everything, but uh, our students that are involved with this or post postgrads that are involved with this seeing uh, more and more of a challenge as the data sets get larger and other things like that. And if you could just comment on that. And also, sorry, what resources can help with uh, training in metadata? I'm at the group this time. <laughs> <laughs> they get a prize. Um, so one of the things that I teach at the DPM workshop is um, preservation metadata management. Um, and in doing so, it's kind of the skills that we're that I'm I'm talking about are more the sort of how do we think about it in an organization. So not the hands-on I'm encoding something, but the actual how do we go about thinking about where are we already creating metadata, and then how do we aggregate it and pull it together. I think Harvard's done a, you guys have done a really good job on having a metadata repository. Um, so I think that. Um, different languages, specific sort of schemas and standards, there's there's information out there. If, if anyone's looking at um, how to think about premise and what premise might do for them as preservation metadata, at the Library of Congress, the, um, the uh, 
maintenance activity for premise. Um, every year there's a premise fair, a premise implementation fair, where people put out the examples of what are they doing, how are they trying to implement premise, which is the preservation uh, metadata, um, and, and what activities on what kinds of content and what kinds of organizations are they. So that's, that's definitely a place that I sort of look at for examples of what people are doing. And then things like the Lavoy Preservation Metadata Technology Watch, um, training specifically on um, metadata schemas and implementation. I think, in, I mean, my experience is, is basically I reach out to other people and say, hey, I hear you're using this tool and you're producing this kind of metadata and what are you doing with it? Um, and so a lot of that is sort of much more the networky kinds of learning. But I'm not sure if, do you have any other? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of tough because metadata is not metadata is not metadata. Right. So, so there's lots of different kinds of metadata. Um, so preservation, uh, the obvious um, solution, as Kari was saying, is, pr is premise to look at that. Um, but then there's, you know, technical metadata. Stuff. There's lots of different technical metadata depending on your content type, you know, images, mm -hmm. audio, video, yeah. documents, et cetera. Um, and then the, there's administrative metadata, rights metadata. Mm -hmm. And beyond all these different schemas, it's, okay, which, which elements do you use? Which do you think are important to record? And then how do you put it all together and store it and index right. it? And, Etc. It's it's a huge, it's a big um, issue. Huge issue, and and I suspect that a lot of institutions do it differently from each other, and that's might be one of those things that you you can't fully learn until you actually work on the job working. Yeah. Within one of these institutions. Yeah, because so much of it of it is absolutely local implementation. So yeah. even if I take like what Harvard's been doing. You know, we just may not even have that kind of content at MIT, which means I certainly don't need to be collecting cer certain types of metadata because yeah. it, it only relates to particular content types or something. So it's a very local implementation. But I do know that if you put out on a list and say, hey, this is the kind of stuff we've got. We're trying to figure out what kind of metadata elements to deal with. We are using these kinds of systems, um, archive space, or some other kind of collection management system. A lot of it is going to be based on what your system needs are. So if your system requires that you have certain types of metadata, clearly you're going to need that type of metadata. Um, if it produces certain types of metadata, you're going to have to figure out what do you do with that metadata. So in, in a lot of ways, it's looking at your local implementations and then figuring out, um, and of that, what can we commit to doing completely over time? You know, if we can commit to five, five metadata elements that we know help us and that's all we can commit to, then that's what you commit to. And then you hope that you can do more things in the future. But even just trying to get all of your digital objects to, to even have a minimal level of metadata for control um, can be a huge effort to even start with, and then deciding on top of that kind of what else to do. But I think a lot of it's the, you know, if you've got still images, you're going to want to look at MIX, which is the technical metadata standard for um, schema for still images. If you've got um, other kinds of content, you want to look at those technical standards. Um, overall, you need to figure out, you know, what preservation actions do we want? Those will be encoded in premise. But you may be collecting them in some other way first. You may not be encoding them in premise elements. So part of it's the matter of the data that you collect and then how you do or do not necessarily right away encode them in any particular schema or standard. Right. So there's kind of the, the difference between the information you need and then the, the way you're organizing that, collecting it, making it automatable, interoperable, or not, depending on how you're keeping your stuff and what you're doing with it. It's very local decisions. Right. But minimally, I think anybody in this field, they, ha they have to know premise. Yeah. I would say look at METS. Yeah. It's METS is being used all over the place to, to package metadata schemas um, in a lot of different systems that you would buy off, off the shelf or open source are, are producing metadata in METS format with different schemas embedded in that. Mm -hmm. um, and then just generically understand XML. And um, yeah, and then look at agencies, and I guess I have to make lyricist commercial. Um, <laughs> one of my coworkers is teaching um, classes in different schemas, which are very, very much an introduction. So the uh, conversation of really, what does this do? Is this what I need? And then um, Rebecca Gunther is doing some mm -hmm. adjunct teaching for us, and she has a Moz class coming up, and she has a Mets yeah. class she's taught yeah. recently. So there are there are yeah. resources out there. Lyricist is one of them. So do take a look, depending mm -hmm. on what they're yeah. And the Copter Registry, C-O-P-T-R, um, which has uh, recently been put out as a community uh, registry for, t for um, uh, 
technology and technical um, information um, is being hosted in the UK, and it's basically trying to pull together. So if you're if you're just like, I have this kind of content, what are the standards, what are the requirements out there for managing that kind of content? You can go to the Copter website and say, I'm looking for still images, things, and it'll show you here's a list of the types of schemas or, or um, our uh, specifications that deal with that kind of, of content or information. Um, so that's, another, that's a recent uh, initiative that's trying to be the mother of all uh, registries without having to have another one on top of that one. So that's right, what yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to do. They're pulling in a lot of other stuff as well, yeah. Any questions in the room? Another one online, Russell, or are we good? I just want to ask um, one final question, and this might, you guys have all touched it, on it a bit. Um, uh, so any last thoughts you want to throw at it? Um, was How do you assess the success of a pairing between an institution and an intern, or an a, a institution and the job swap or job mm -hmm. shadow? Um, how, how do you assess that success or not? <laughs> I'll talk about so the idea of job the job shadowing type of idea. I think I think it's um, like we do with, with digital curation, it's taking the long view. <laughs> um, in most cases, if someone's coming to your place for a week, it, it's gonna be difficult to work out what the tangible benefits are during that week. Um, but for me, what's been useful is if I don't feel like I'm just giving out and getting nothing back. Um, so that means the person has had good questions. Um, the person came with uh, some sort of even if not prior knowledge of the topic of things that we're, you know, I was talking about with digital archives, she had she had questions about like, I, I understand I'm supposed to do something with workflows. Do you have workflows we could take a look at and you could walk me through, you know, what are the decision points? And so I think that for me the success has been um, when someone comes and says, I've got a list of questions, I have things I want to talk about with you, um, and when they leave, I feel like I've been able to um, look more critically at my own. Uh, work and then and that that's helped me either affirm what I've done like oh, I did a good job with that one <laughs> All right, or wow, you know that person raised some things I hadn't thought about because I'm not an outsider in my organization You know she saw some stuff that I wasn't considering um, So to let me think about developing better in the future um, I think an unsuccessful one is when someone comes in and they just sort of uh, Ask a whole lot of questions that sort of that are interesting, but aren't relevant you know, like, it's almost like I'm interested in learning about why we do digital archives, which is okay if it then gets practically down to the how do we do it. But if someone's just asking questions, you know, tell me about blah, 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 that's, that could be interesting for mentoring, but that's not interesting and useful as a swap, I would say. I mean, Andrea can speak to this, I'm sure, but what we did or what we're doing is we did the surveys of the host we did the surveys of the residents. Um, you look and see if the project was indeed completed. Uh, one of the, um, I guess, ways that we could tell it was really worthwhile is that um, ALA, uh, and I can never think of the name of that uh, publication that comes out of that, uh, oh, um, some kind of, uh, yeah. it's the round table that sponsored the residency talk this past midwinter. Anyway, they asked the residents to publish, the, you know, to submit for consideration for publication. So it seemed like it was worthwhile. Also, we have someone that's going to come in that's very objective, uh, that was not part of IMLS or the library or any of the host institutions. And they're doing uh, in-person interviews, uh, actually looking very closely at the projects. Uh, and looking to see if indeed it was a good match and if and what could be done better. So it's basically evaluations and, and surveys, but it's got to be objective. I mean, I think from the resident standpoint and the host standpoint, sometimes it's very subjective. Uh, it's just based on their experience. So they can't just do an out of body and just look down on it and say, you know, this was good and this was bad. I don't. Yeah, we'll, we'll be doing similar evaluations. Um so I think the, the two things that, that we'll be looking at is um, did, did each party learn something and did something right. tangible, something of value come out of it? So, mm -hmm. so um, for the residents, I, I'm seeing a lot of them come out of graduate school with um, 
kind of this idea of this is what I want to do, that, you know, everything's going to fall into place, and I'm going to work on this particular type of content, and I'm going to do this. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to encourage them to open up their minds more because right. th they'll find a lot more job opportunities if they kind of broaden their skills and they're willing to work with all different kinds of material and not just come out and say, I'm doing digital video game preservation. I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, there's, there's like a, two places you can apply, and I don't think they have positions open. So, <laughs> so um, if they learn something, if they come out of it, but also there's something tangible that they can sell themselves with. And on the, the host side, if, if they learn from the process, um, learn from each other, but also um, that, that um, bullet point that George had about the percentage that are actually going to put into place what the resident worked on. Right. You, you know, if, if I, I think that if, if the host is actually working with the resident and things are going well, then they are going to implement whatever it is that the resident put into place. Otherwise, they would have told them early on, no, we need to go in this other direction. You know, so, so that's kind of what I'm looking for in a good pairing. And I think you look at ARL, like that was an example in PBS. That was just two I could have given others, is that, you know, they're actually going to put the residents, implement the residents' work into their workflow and, and how they're doing business. So that certainly um, tells you that it was a worthwhile and successful uh, effort. And just another quick comment on the idea of like how, how it's a good fit like between the, per the people themselves. Um, one of the things that kind of going back to the idea of, you know, hang out your dirty laundry, be honest. I mean, if you're going to, if someone says, hey, I'd like to come and talk with you for four hours and find out what you're doing, you know, be honest, like, okay, well, here's what I could imagine that would be like, <laughs> you know, this is the information I can tell you, you know, like, you know, I, you know, I'm interested in knowing what's going on at the corporate office. Well, I can't tell you exactly, but here's what I can tell you, you know, here's what I can do for you. And then ask that person, why do they want to come? And what is it that they plan to get out of it? And just be very specific about asking those questions because if not, you do end up with these, someone sort of shows up and you've spent a whole day with them and you're like, what, what was that all? <laughs> nice, um, but not quite sure what that was all about. So just be really honest about what is it that you can offer someone and what is it that you hope to get out of them and then and finding out what they're looking for as well. Um, because then you can say, this is worthy of my time. I can talk to my management and say why it is I should spend this amount of time with them and what I can get back out of it in the future. Like, And they've invited me to go down to their place. I'm invited to go down to Melbourne just as soon as I can get there myself. Um, they can't pay for me to go there, but if I ever show up, they are more than happy to have me come and spend a week with them, which is fantastic. Now I just got to figure out a way to get over there. Um, <laughs> but that was nice, you know, like, so I thought, okay, that's, that's a good exchange if at some point we can ever cash in on that. So there you go. We have two minutes left. So on that note of an internship can also get you a road trip. Um, I want to thank you guys for participating online, in the room. I'd like to thank our speakers for making the trip to Atlanta. I really appreciate that very much. Um, we, as I said, we will be putting recordings up. Um, I've gotten the, um, yeah, we'll talk about the slide, uh, the slide presentations, make sure those, we can get those for you guys. And if you have any questions, um, my, again, my name is Alex Bentrude. I'm the Preservation Services Librarian at Lyricist. If you need help getting in contact with any of these people, if we went too quick and you didn't see contacts, you can go come through me, Google them. We can help you out. So again, thank you very much. Thanks, Georgia Tech, for helping us out. And everybody have a great rest of the day. Thanks very much.